the viewers have spoken and the clear winner on my vote for my next video was Wolfpack by a three to one margin of thumbs under the video. So we are demonstrating today here Wolfpack, which is subtitled Submarine Warfare in the North Atlantic, 1942 to 44. It is a solo design game by SPI from 1974. I obtained a copy that is in really excellent condition. Um, I'll show you some of the counters as we go through, but the the counters are just in great shape. The map is in, pr in really good shape, too. There's like a little creasing here, but for such an old game, really great shape. The only thing that is unfortunate about the copy I got was some uh, unfortunate highlighting of the rules, which, you know, marginally helpful, but somebody else is highlighting. I just don't like to highlight rules, so that's too bad, but really... I got a great copy of this game, and it's quite enjoyable to play because of that, because for me, the physical components um, do make a difference. And even though this is incredibly old school, and you'll see when we get into the game and pulling back here to look at the map with all the tables, it's, um, it's excellent to be playing with something that's so old and yet in such great shape. So we're going to take a look here. This is a little bit, well, it's an early game, but... There's a game set up here. What I want to do first is show you that the only playing area in this game is the light colored hexes there. That everything else around here, the dark blue hexes and the land here that we have, uh, I should point out this is actually not the setup. I had to take down this stack because I was covering this up. These are a stack of planes that are coming out of Ulster here. But all of this, all this nice map here, the dark water here, and of course the tables and charts, these are not actually active playing areas. This is the only active playing area, and it's pretty small. This was a magazine game, and I think it was later released as a box game. I believe I have the magazine game. It did not come with a box, and I'm not sure that it's possible to tell. But in any case, let's check out first our terrain features here, and it says quite clearly the light blue is the main playing area of the map. It's really the only playing area of the map. You have the dark blue, which is prohibited areas. We have a couple of fog zones here, and these are denoted by the dotted and dashed lines, and fog has some effect in the game, which we'll get to. They do give you, there are some um, airbase hexes, and you have aerial units coming in and again I spread this out because I was covering up the game. Here we have for example the Newfoundland base of air operations and you would have your stack of planes coming in from there. You do need uh, in various parts of the game to figure out how far away they are from the U-boats they're trying to sight. So there's some pretty helpful markers here so you don't have to keep counting a 10 hex range, a 7 hex range. The aerial unit, the only indication you have on it is the range. So everything in this is very abstract. Well, not everything, but a lot is very abstracted. So that's your airplane, and it has a range of that. And finally, we have these storm formation hexes. There are three different areas that can be uh, formed with storms A, B, and C. We have currently here one storm on the map, which was originally formed in hex or storm formation B. It sort of stays in the same range. It's basically moving this way. And a storm is always indicated by these three counters. And the total affected area of the storm is around the three counters. So that's for a total of 17 hexes. What's going on in this game, the victory conditions, is that you are playing the U-boats here as we take a look at uh, a counter indicating a single U-boat, and this type of counter represents the wolf pack. Uh, this is a wolf pack of six. Every triangular pip you see on a counter represents six individual boats, and you are able, as part of your strategy, to separate out and move your boats um, individually or grouping them together into larger wolf packs. And as I said, the larger uh, counters will be indicated by additional pips. So for example, if you had a wolf pack of 12, it would look like this. 
and I think this is the largest you can get. So that is six times five because each of those pips represents the six boats. And the indication on the left in terms of what the numbers are is going to be the combat strength on the left and the movement on the right. So you can see obviously as you increase your strength your ability to be mobile and move around is decreased. And again single counter here. What are you uh, measured on? Well, you're measured on the number, the tonnage that you are sinking. So the tonnage sunk track is below and you're keeping track of this as the game goes. It is a 15 turn game and they tell you what each turn represents in terms of real time. I'll put that up on the screen. I can't remember that right now. I want to make a point here on the victory conditions that comes from the developer's notes in the back of the game. They're explaining a little bit about the scenarios that the U-boat was forced to give away its whereabouts, of course, when it attacks. The result was an attritional battle in which ever greater numbers of U-boats were sacrificed as the war progressed. Blah, blah. For this reason, the four scenarios we have included are all taken from the sole period in which there was some degree of equity between the opposing forces. And it goes on to explain that. So indeed, the focus on 1943 in the scenarios is intentional. I guess perhaps what could have been different was just indicating that this is about submarine warfare in 1943. But, you know, maybe that was a marketing reason to make it sound a little more interesting. And the final point here, this is from the player's notes, the game notes in the back of the rules, that um, the victory conditions listed here, uh, the substantive and decisive victory levels are very difficult to achieve, particularly in the later scenarios. And it basically goes on to explain that historically that the Germans would have had to achieve a decisive victory each month of 42 to 43, but actually in terms of the game, they scored a marginal victory in February, a substantive victory in March, and very bad defeats in April and May. So that could come into play if you're looking at the difficulty of the game. And again, uh, we have the victory table here that will explain to you how to categorize your victory should you achieve one. In terms of what happens at the game start, we are playing the February 1943 scenario here, and we're just going to pull in and look at this table of initial forces. It is going to indicate to us what we get. So again, we are the U-boats, and the reason I keep saying this is because one of the effects of the game, as you'll see as I'm discussing it, to be quite honest with you, is that because the U-boats are searching for the convoys and the convoys also don't know where the U-boats are, there are times during the game where it's just hard to remember that you're the U-boats because you're conducting searches on both sides. And it, I don't know if it's because I'm filming, but it happened when I was playing on my own too. Um, it's just a weird... It's a weird side effect of, of the way the game is. In any event, I'll talk more about that in my thoughts. So we are instructed that we get 42 points uh, or 42 units of U-boats. And again, they can be represented by these individual counters, or you can choose to group them out and just switch them out. But the total amount of U-boats we get does not change through the scenario. We get 42. The counters here, these are the convoys that are coming in, and there's going to be 20 of them. There's always 20 convoys in any scenario. These are different types of slow-moving merchant vessels, and the indication here um, is going to show you the range that they have in hexes and also the general direction that they go. So generally speaking, these are going to be moving toward the east, and these are going to be moving toward the west. I say general because in the convoy movement, as we'll see, sometimes you get a northeast or a northwest direction, but they're not going to double back. They're going to be moving simply in that direction. They are accompanied by escorts, and the escorts are going to be um, assigned to them and in 
real life. These were um, escorts that were trained in anti-submarine warfare and contained um, many types of weapons that could fight the subs. In this game, a very clever mechanic, I think, is that you have a dummy escort, and then you have your actual assigned escorts. So for our scenario, we are getting simply two, 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 and two of these escorts, as well as all of the 12 dummy escorts. Here we're looking at four counters, and we can see there is a difference in the visual depiction of the allied convoys and the escorts. But what can be confusing is that on the convoys, this number here refers to their movement value and direction and facing. But here, this is a referral to a combat strength value. And when you're looking at these close up, as I'm showing you here, I mean, you can see the difference in the picture and the dummy, uh, the dummy um, escorts obviously have the same image as the real escorts, but to be honest, when you're looking at them in the context of the map far away, it's just a little confusing. And once you turn something face up, it can be a little confusing. Is that Every allied convoy that you see pictured here, these are the ones waiting to come in, and these are the ones that are on the map, is paired with an escort or a dummy that is turned upside down. This is a very clever way of representing the possibility on the map of an allied convoy, but without actually knowing whether it's there. And there are certain circumstances in which you are going to reveal the inverted escort counter, and if in fact it turns into a dummy, the whole thing just vanishes. It doesn't actually really mean that it was there. And you can see from the proportion, we have 12 dummy units, and we only have two, four, six, eight actual escorts. So among these 20, there are 12 of them that are really not actually there. So that is a clever way of kind of creating some of the fog of war while still allowing you to place counters on the map and have them moving because otherwise, you know, how would you depict something that you don't know if you're playing a game? Um, and this is how it was done. And I think it's a very effective way. What I have here lined up are the allied convoys waiting to come in. The initial setup table here tells you to roll your uh, well, to choose a chit, this game did not come with a D10. It came with zero to nine number chits that I will not be using, but um, you were meant to pull one out for all of these rolls. And then based on that, it will tell you what the initial placement are for the first five convoys. And thereafter, they come in turn by turn. And that's how I have them lined up here. And then to add to that, you have the fact of the searching both ways that I referred to earlier, which is to say that you have planes searching for U-boats, and of course you have the U-boats searching for convoys, and you have this back and forth, which is necessary to model the actual action, but for me became difficult in terms of identifying as whatever side that I was on as I was playing out the various searches that happen. And of course, this game is mostly about searches. So I think that's another reason why the tension or the narrative development wasn't quite there for me. A lot of the rest of this video is going to be showing you what happens during the sequence of play, but we'll just briefly look at, they've got the abbreviated sequence of play down the left side of the map, starting with A going to F off camera right now. And uh, the convoy initial placement phase, we've got a, a separate first turn placement of the convoys. And then we move into the weather phase. I mentioned that there was both fog and storms. And as with everything in this game, what you're doing is based on these tables here that surround the map. So you're going to the fog and storm formation table, for example, or the uh, storm and convoy movement table to see how something forms, how something moves, and uh, placing that on the map. The air phase has to do with allocation of air escorts, and then air searches. And again, this is where the um, 
identification, I guess I'd say, uh, of the player, me, with what I'm doing, which is being the U-Boats, gets a little bit confusing. And because in this segment, for example, you're searching, you begin here searching for the U-Boats. So the air search are going to be conducting they're the air units coming in are going to be conducting searches for these U-boats, for you, and then if you are detected, combat will ensue. But of course, later on in the game, you're going to be searching for the convoys, and it just gets a little bit, it almost becomes like a neutral in a way. I don't know how best to say it. And I'll, I'll state up front, I have not played this game repeatedly, so it's possible that due to my limited exposure in playing the game, I'm feeling this way. It's maybe if you play the game repeatedly, which honestly I don't think I will end up doing, um, you do form more of an identification with one side. That didn't happen for me or it hasn't happened for me thus far. In any case, the next phase is the naval phase where the, <clears throat> excuse me, the convoys are moving and <clears throat> you are uh, then potentially entering U-boat surge zones, and if you are, then you need to see whether you are sighted, and they're moving on. The uh, U-boat operations phase, I mentioned at some point earlier looking at the counters, you can form and reform your packs of U-boats and move them around. So you're never going to get any more U-boats. And of course, if you lose U-boats in combat, you'll end up with fewer during the course of the game. But you can reorganize them and separate them out. So for example, if you have a pack here of six, you can replace these with this pack here with six individual units and then move them around as you wish. And then the final phase here is um, U-boat attack and counterattack, and ultimately moving the game turn forward. I fear this video is going to get pretty long, so I'm going to just briefly talk about this fog and storm formation table. There's not much to it, really. Essentially, looking at the column on the left, you're you know, either choosing a chit or rolling a d10, and then based on that and based on your scenario, you're coming up with whether there's going to be fog or storm. And also, here is the uh, storm and convoy movement table. So when you have the storms out, they move, and it's the same table for the convoys moving we're going to talk in detail about this table in, in light of the convoys later in the video. But again, the same basic um, mechanic here. You are choosing a, you're rolling a die or choosing a chit, and based on that number and counter or cross referencing it with the last number of the hex that the storm is in, in this case, you're coming up with the movement, and the key is down here. What's clever about this when it comes to the convoys is that. Because the single chit pull or the single die roll is cross-referenced with any possibility of hex number ending, you only have to roll once to move all of your convoys, and we'll get into that later, but it saves on some of the, the die rolling. But for the purposes of storms, you do your roll, you see where the storm is, and then you move accordingly. The storm movement is nine hexes. What's the purpose of this fog and storm? Well, they do have some different effects, and I'm just showing you, just for some variety's sake, the rule book here, that um, there are basic effects if a convoy, for example, the weather effect here, um, if the convoy is straggled or inverted in a fog hex and something um, happens, then you make a determination whether it becomes straggled or you know impacted, meaning it, impacted by the weather. And there are two straggle markers, straggle one and straggle two. And you can see that at the end of this determination segment, all the convoys get returned to their face-up position. Uh, you also, as a U-boat, need to expend additional movement to enter a storm hex. And of course, as you would suspect, air groups cannot search or attack U-boats that are in fog or storm hexes. And Let's see, sighting is impacted as well, as you would see, um, and the attacks are impacted. So basically modeling what you would, what you would 
expect dealing with fog and storm weather when you've got um, submarines looking for convoys and convoys looking for submarines and air personnel looking down to see convoys and subs. There's something about the air search rules that I can't figure out if it makes sense or it's odd. We're looking here at a group of six airplanes that are going to be searching for this one U-boat here that's three hexes away. And per the rules, what we do is we multiply the number of the air group searching, so that's six, by the total number of the U-boats in the hex, which is one, and then we divide the result by six. So we get six times one is six, divided by six is one, and it instructs us if there's a fraction, we round up. And that is the number that comes on the table that will be interacting with the die roll to result in success or failure. And in this case, we would have to roll just a one to succeed. And I'll show you what I mean by looking, referring to the actual table itself. So we have the range listing here of the number of hexes away. And this is the air sub product number that I referred to. So we're on the one. So in this particular case, with the six airplanes looking for the one U-boat, we would need to roll a one to succeed. Now let's look here at Newfoundland. We've got one plane looking for one U-boat and one, two, three, four, five away. And it could be up to seven away and still be in the same column. So basically one times one is one divided by six, one six, but we're instructed to round up. So it also brings us back to the same column on this table where the success rate is the same. So basically what it's saying is that one plane searching for one U-boat has the same chance of success as six planes searching for one U-boat. And I find that to be a little strange. As with everything in this game, what we do is determined by reference to various tables. So looking at this convoy here to determine its movement, what we do is we roll a D10 and based on that roll, as well as the number of the hex it's on, and I'm going to just come in here and show you because it's hard for me to see, it is on a hex ending in the number 9. So what we do is we compare the hex number that it is in to our D10 roll, which was a 9. So we actually were in hex 9, we rolled a 9, and we look here at the storm and convoy movement table. We come down to the nine column here, and then all of these numbers are going to be based um, on the hex number that we are in, the end of the hex number. So we only roll once. This is actually a pretty good way of dealing with a lot of various um, attributes that you need. So we're going to need numbers for all of our convoys that are out here. And rather than having us roll many times, we roll once, and then we would, based on the hex number, come up with the attributes. So in the case I'm showing you here, we rolled a 9, we were on hex ending in 9, and we come up with an n value, and an n value shows us that we are moving northeast. We're always moving the full movement value of our convoy, and in that case this will be six. So our instruction then would be to move six hexes, one, two, three, four, five, six, ultimately ending up here. Now, you'll see here there's a U-boat here. We don't know this, but, well, we do, but we don't. And what we need to do when we enter this hex, the rules instruct us that the U-boat is then going to have an opportunity to search for us. So I'll show you what happens then. So what we do is we're going to move into this hex, and then we're going to conduct the U-boat search for us because we've entered this hex. And regardless of what happens, whether we're detected or not, we will ultimately continue on with the rest of our movement. There are, of course, the submarine searches made by the convoys. And honestly, this can get a little bit confusing when you're playing the game. But nevertheless, Again, procedure basically the same, just to remember the rules. We're looking at a different table here for this picket search, and not surprisingly, it's the picket search table. The values on this table, as we come up and see it here, have to do with the 
search zone that our U-boat or Wolfpack exerts. We have one U-boat here, and that is just a one hex search zone. When you have wolf packs, they can pot potentially have a three hex search zone. So for example, just to take a look here at a different situation. This single U boat, the search zone is its own hex only. This wolf pack here of six strength has a search zone of its own hex as well as the hex before it and after it. So it has a three hex search zone, and that's the maximum search zone in this game. So to move back to our example, we are dealing with a one hex search zone. And what we're doing here, the, the values here refer to the overall strength of the number of U-boats we have. And in this case, it's we're falling on the one to two because it's one simple U-boat. So we're taking our D10, and we rolling again. Oh no, a six, not a nine. So we rolled a six this time. Coming back up here, looking down, and it's going to be nothing. Confirming. U boat fails to side convoy, immediately resume movement. So that we were not detected here. And then we will just continue on the rest of our movement, which I believe we had three movement points left and one, two, three, then that would conclude the movement portion for that convoy alone. We would continue this procedure for the um, all the convoys that are on the map here. Here we are at the crux of the game. This is the U-boat operations phase, the pack formation and reorganization segment, and the U-boat movement segment. And Again, ultimately what we're trying to do is to detect as many convoys as we can so that we can conduct combat with them. Now you may say, well, you know, it's a big ocean and how do we know where they're going to move? And we are restricted in terms of conducting combat because we cannot conduct combat from just any random hex that's adjacent to a uh, convoy. We must be immediately in front of the convoy during our combat segment. So we need to be positioned correctly so that when the convoy ends its movement, it ends up right in front of us. And that sounds, on the face of it, pretty tough to do. But here's the here's the problem with all of this, at least as I have been able to assess it again with a relatively limited amount of playtime in this game. We're going to come back here and look at this storm and convoy movement table a little bit more closely. What you can see pretty clearly is that almost regardless, or is it completely regardless of any number that you pull, you are going to be getting a high percentage of chance, a 70% chance that the convoy movement is going to be lateral, that is to say due east or due west. The chances of it moving northerly or, or southerly, it's a 2 in 10 chance of northern and a 1 in 10 chance of southern. So the bulk of your searchers, of your U-boats, are always going to be placed to cover unsighted convoy's lateral movement. So when you are looking to reorganize, and I've just completely messed up the game here to show you, if you had a pack like this, and again, remembering that each pip here is representative of six individual units, so this would be potentially 24 U-boats, or it would be 24 U-boats that you could potentially separate in some way, you would have some sense of possibly where to put them. Well, this is moving away from you, but um, let's just say right here, you know that these are coming and there's a 70% chance they're going to continue in their lateral movement. You know what the movement allowance is and you know per the rules that even if they enter a hex where the U-boats could potentially search for them, they have to complete their movement per the rules. They have to do 100% of their movement and that will happen whether or not they are detected and fired upon by a U-boat that they are traveling over that hex. So it seems to me, while it's not 
easy per se, it seems to take away some of the confusion or fog of war or lack of knowledge about what's happening because you see the table and you understand those odds right there from looking at the table, you know, not very closely even. So this to me is where I feel the game fails a bit. Um, and I'll save further thought about that for my final thoughts. But in the convoy movement phase, this is what is what is happening, excuse me, in the um, <clears throat> the U-boat phase, you are reorganizing your units, you're scattering them or concentrating them as you see fit to hopefully be positioned in the right way so that when the, uh, the next time the convoys continue their movement, you will encounter them in the right place to conduct your attacks. The procedure for attacking a sighted convoy is actually pretty simple. Of course, the difficulty is in sighting them as we've seen, but I'm going to show you here what happens when a U-boat is in position to attack a sighted convoy. So they have to be sighted, and the U-boat, or U-boats in this case, because we've got wolf pack of 12, need to be in the adjacent hex to the forward position of the convoy. Now in this case, you see we're above a storm, and the storm is going to have an impact on our die roll because it's going to make it more difficult to conduct the combat. We're gonna lose three off whatever we roll. What we do is we take the combat differential between us, which is 15, and their escort, which is 1. That brings us to a 14. There are no other modifications on the strength of the escort here. If this were a straggled convoy, there would be a negative modifier as well. But in this case, we have the differential of 14. We are rolling our d10 and we got a five. So we're gonna come up here and look at the combat results table. Remember we are on a differential of 14. So that would be this column here. We rolled a five and we received a number two. This is equal to the number of victory points. And it says here each victory point represents one merchant ship sunk or about 5,000 gross tons. Now. It just uh, the rules tell us. Just pulling back here to look, there is a historical note that is of importance for the concept of the game. That is reminding us that a. Let me see if I can show it to you here. A convoy unit can never be eliminated as a result of U-boat attacks. Historically, even a small merchant convoy displaced over a quarter of a million tons of shipping. No World War II convoy was ever totally destroyed. So you're not actually removing anything from the map, even if you are gaining victory points by sinking some of the merchant ships with it. So you would come down to the victory point table here and indicate we received two victory points. That's equal to 10,000 tons, and I believe I showed you earlier, you can mark your total victory both here on the tens and the ones table as you progress through the game. When I started my game channel just over a year ago, I originally planned to go through the solitaire design war games in a certain playlist that would be devoted to them in in order in chronological order, starting with the very first one, which was an S&T game, Fall of Rome, and then moving forward. I got Fall of Rome, I filmed half a video, and I chucked the whole thing because I never really could understand the game well enough, and down to I wasn't even sure what certain count were. This game is the third, I mentioned this in my choose the video, uh, but I want to point it out again. This game is the third solitaire game from SPI after Fall of Rome and Operation Olympic. Does that make it the third solitaire game, the third solitaire war game ever? I'm not sure, but it certainly is an early one regardless, again from 1974. And for that reason, and also because of the pedigree of the designers that you can see here again, it is of interest to me. My thoughts about how the game played out, well, the game does model historical events enough to the extent that 
If you can't cite a convoy, you can't attack it. And it is difficult to cite convoys, and you spend a lot of time trying to do so. In terms of how that plays as a game, um, one could say it gets maybe a little bit tedious. I don't mind the um, use, the extensive use of tables, and I certainly appreciate the design of the game where the tables are all here. What happens in the game is you do indeed spend a great deal of time focusing on the tables and using them to set up searches and different types of combat and um, combat results, etc. I guess that's part and parcel of this kind of game, and it certainly is, I think, probably the case. I haven't played Silent Victory, just to name one other submarine game of a more modern ilk, but I've watched some videos on it, and that has an extensive sequence of play and seems so procedural to me. It's at a different scale than this one, but I just never really investigated it further. What I enjoyed about this game was the scale of it and the sense that you are looking out over the North Atlantic and there is the movement of the convoys across and the dispersal of your own U-boats to try to sight them and then attack them. Again, what I didn't like was the fact that I felt, based on the movement table, there was a pretty available to you strategy for maximizing the sighting. Now, even so, it's hard to do that. And of course, the other difficulty is that when you are counting up your victory points at the end, you do need to um, reduce by two any of the U-boats that you have that get destroyed, and they do get destroyed. So the game becomes hard to win. That in and of itself isn't a problem, but it was a very quiet game for me. It felt, um, I don't want to say ponderous, but it felt meditative, I guess is one way to put it. I did not actually get through an entire game feeling as if there was any increase of tension throughout, so that by the time I was in the latter portions of the game, it seemed the same to me tension-wise as it did in the earlier portions of the game. I guess the storms and the fog have some dynamic aspects because they will slow you down, but they can also cause the convoys to become straggled, and when they're straggled, they're more vulnerable to attack. So there's sort of some quote-unquote excitement there to see how the storm's going to roll over a convoy or whether it's going to roll over a convoy and impact it. But at the end of the day, for me, the uh, benefit of this game was more in playing out an early solitaire game and seeing the design, the mechanics, and the best one of those mechanics for me I talked about earlier was the hidden escort where um, there is some sense there you spend all this time trying to see what something is and then it turns out to be nothing. So that was sort of cool and um, dynamic, but overall it just felt like a very, and played like a very quiet game for me. So that is Wolfpack from SPI 1974.